Welcome to Finding Holiness, where we delve into timeless Torah wisdom, revealing the sacred in everyday moments. Join us on a journey to elevate your spirituality and discover holiness in every aspect of life. I'm your host, Rabbi David Kadosh, and together, let's embark on a path of spiritual exploration. I hope you enjoy this next episode. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of our Thursday night Parashat Shavua class. We're happy you can join us here again one more time to study another parasha, Parashat Ki the parasha that contains the most mitzvot in the entire Torah, a total of 74 mitzvot in Parashat Ki And tonight, with your permission, we would like to delve into one of them and find the deeper meanings of what exactly it represents in the grand scheme of things, not just the more, the more literal explanations or way of uh, of looking at the mitzvah. In this week's parasha, we want to also establish a connection between the parasha and the avodah of the month of Elul. During this month, which is designated for teshuvah, we prepare ourselves for the yamim noraim, we prepare ourselves for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and we want to focus on some of the mitzvot to see if we can indeed make that connection. The mitzvah I want to speak about tonight, which is a negative mitzvah, mitzvah lo ta'ase, which states, lo taharos beshor ubahamor yahdav. Torah tells us that you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Now, there are many straightforward explanations that are suggested why the Torah felt the need, why HaKadosh Baruch Hu felt to include this in the 613 misvot. Two of them are related to animal abuse. The first appears in the commentary of the Ibn Ezra. And he explains that being that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is infinitely merciful, Hashem took pity on the donkey. And the reason is because the donkey lacks the sheer strength in comparison to the ox. If the two animals were to plow together, then the stronger ox would force the donkey to plow faster and push the donkey beyond its physical limits. And that is an example of tsar ba'ale hayim. It's an example of cruelty to animals. Unnecessary pain for the donkey. The Chizkuni also presents a similar rationale, and he says, "En koach hachamor ke koach hashor." The strength of the donkey is not like the ox, but he goes on and adds another reason. Beautiful chidush, she hashor maale gera tamid veochel, because the ox is since it's a kosher animal, it chews its cud. It's constantly eating food. The hamor eno maale gera, but. The donkey is not a kosher animal, does not chew its cut. It shows that this one is eating, the ox is constantly eating, and the donkey is not eating, because the donkey, once it swallows, it doesn't come back up. This is another example of cruelty to the donkey, because the donkey looks over, he doesn't know that the ox chews its cut, and it's the same food that they, he ate the first time. He sees it eating over and over again. And this is an example where the donkey gets upset. So they're plowing together. You're hurting the feelings of the donkey. We care much for the feelings of the donkey. And indeed, the Torah prohibits us from plowing them together. There is a fascinating explanation of brought down by the Gemara that I want to share with you tonight. The Gemara Masechet Avodah Zarah says the following, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, my dikhtiv, what's the meaning of the following pasuk? This pasuk in Yishayahu, Ashrechem zor'e al kolmaim meshalche regel hashor ve'ahamor. Fortunate are you who plant upon all waters, who send away the feet of the ox and the donkey. A ve- uh, uh, the, the ox and the donkey. A very cryptic pasuk. So the Gemara says, Praiseworthy are the Jewish people who engage in Torah and Gemilut Chasadim. Yitzram masur beyadam behen ve'en hem mesurim beyad Yitzram. 
their yetzer is delivered into their hands, and they are not delivered into the hands of the yetzer. Through the study of the Torah, the Jews are able to fight the yetzer ara. Shneemar, ashrechem zorea kol mayim. As it says, fortunate are you by who sow by all the waters. Ve'en zeria el ha Whenever you have the verb sowing or planting, it refers to sedaka. Ve'en mayim el Torah. Whenever we see water, we know that means Torah. So what's the meaning of the second half of the Pasuk? Meshalchei regel hashor ve'ahamor, which is, uh, send away the feet of the ox and the donkey. Tana debe liyahu le'olam yasim adam atzmo al divre Torah keshor le'ol ve'chachamor lemasoi. That a person should always perceive, apply himself, the words of Torah like an ox to a yoke and like a donkey to a burden. This is the Gemara in Masechet Abu Dazara. So what does we see? That the Yetzir Hara, the same Yetzir Hara that combats us every day, is described as the feet of the ox and of the donkey. Whereas those who study Torah and perform acts of Hasid, those are the people that send away the feet of the ox and of the donkey. Um, thwarting the efforts of the Yetzirah. So what we need to figure out is why the Yetzirah is associated with the ox and the donkey. Tonight is the Hilula of the Ben Ishai, the Ben Yosef Chaim in Baghdad. And we're going to actually quote him a couple of times in tonight's Shi'ur. Uh, may the Zechut of uh, the Ben Ishai protect all of Kal Israel. In one of his sefers called the Ben Yehoyada, which is a commentary on many of the Agadic literature in Talmud, he explains that the unintentional and intentional Yetzir Hara is referred to as the ox and the donkey. And he quotes the Maran al-Sheikh, he says in, in, uh, in Parashat Mishpatim, V'nafal shamashor o hamor, if someone digs a pit and a, a donkey and an ox fall into it, it's actually implying, it's alluding to one who causes damage deliberately, that is represented by the ox, and where, where a person intends to damage, whereas one who ca- causes damage inadvertently is represented by the donkey, because the donkey is not an animal that intends to damage. So the Yetzirah that persuades a person not to perform an act of chesed on behalf of a friend is the Yetzirah that joins an ox and a donkey together. The, the Torah prohibits plowing an ox with a donkey so that the donkey will not suffer when it hears the ox chewing its cud while it has nothing to eat. Similarly, when a poor person has nothing to eat, he suffers, says the Ben Ishchai, when he sees his neighbor enjoying all the delicacies of Olam Azem, all the food and the, the wonderful things that he enjoys, but the poor person suffers when he sees it. And this is the point of the Gemara's elucidation according to the Ben Ishchai with regards to those who study Torah and perform acts of chesed on behalf of their fellow man. Fortunate are you who sow upon all the waters, who send away the feet of the ox and the donkey. They drive away the Yetzer who is called the feet of the ox of the donkey. And it tries to persuade a person not to be bothered by its neighbor's troubles and distress. The neighbor, the poor person is suffering when the Yetzer is trying to keep you busy so that you don't notice. And this is, according to the Ben Ishchai, a deeper meaning of what it is. Shor v'chamor lo taharos yachdav. You cannot plow an ox and donkey together. That already is a tremendous novelty. But we're going to go, Bezrat Hashem, much more profoundly in this interpretation. There is a mitzvah to say, lo taharos b'shor v'chamor yachdav. The Ramah Mipano, says that when the sin of the golden calf took place, the Cheta Egel, that the upper half of this calf towards the head resembled an ox eating grass. And the lower half of the calf rep- towards the tail represented a donkey. This is what he writes in his Sefer. And the upper half of the ox and the lower half of the donkey represents two elements of the negative forces regarding the unholy and improper combination and union 
between two very distinct yet powerful negative enemies. And it is when Bnei Israel saw this calf, half ox, half donkey, they proclaimed, El Elohecha Yisrael, these are your God, O, 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 o Israel. The source of this idea is actually found in the Zohar. When the Erev Rav, those individuals that caused the problems at the, in, during the time of the desert, the leaders of the pack when it came to, to the Haita Egel, the Torah tells us that the entire people unburdened themselves of their golden rings in Aaron, threw it into a fire, and an Egel emerged, says the Zohar, in the shape of an ox and a donkey. Says the Megale Amukot, the divine Kabbalist. And he says that the mitzvah in this week's parasha that we began with, don't plow with an ox and a donkey together. The deeper meaning is that it is prohibited to have a union between these two forces of Tum'ah, these two forces of impurity that all the nations of the world are affiliated with the force of the ox and the force of the donkey. The Zohar Kadosh says that when these two forces join together as one, the world is doomed. And that's the implication of the Pasuk, Lota Haros Beshoru Bahamor Yachdav. The Megale Amukot writes in Parashat Lech Lecha, he says, what HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed Abraham Avinu during the Brit Ben Abetarim when he was promised that he was going to, that they was going to give for him, bring him a nation that was going to stem from him on condition that his people have to be in a foreign land for 400 years. The Pasuk says, That Abraham Avinu took all of the things that he gathered to him and he split them in the center. There are 70 nations in the world. They are divided into two groups. 35 are on one side, on the left side of the Kedusha, represented by the evil angel Samael Samechmem Aleph Lamed, also known as the Samechmem. And the opposite, on the right side, you have another negative angel, Reish Bet, that is the guardian of Yishmael, representing another 35. So you have 35 on the left side, the guardian angel of Esav. And you have 35 on the right side, the guardian angel of Ishmael. So we have 70 nations. Ele, opposite Ele. In other words, you take the word Ele, it's Aleph, Lamed, Hey. Lamed, Hey is 35. So you have Lamed, Hey, 35 nations on the right, with their leader, the Aleph, that is Ishmael, and then you have another Lamed Hay on the left, 35, with their Aleph and their leader of Esav, Ele, opposite Ele. And that's the allusion in the Parashav Lech Lecha, where Abraham Avinu makes his brief in Abetarim with Hashem. Vaikach lo et kol Ele. Abraham Avinu took all, all the nations together. Vaivater otam batavech, and he split them into two halves. He split them and placed Bnei Israel in between. That's what we say every single day during Shahrit on days with Tachanun. Ele barechev ve'ele basusim. These with the chariots, these with the horses, also representing the 35 nations on the right, the 35 nations on the left. So says the Megale Amukod, Lo tacharos peshoru v'chamor yachdav. Yishmael is the corrupted aspect of Abraham Avinu's Midav Chesed. He is the Chesed of the Klipa, the Klipa of the donkey. He is the leader of the 35 nations on the right side. Esav, on the other hand, is the corrupted aspect of Yitzchak's Mida of Gevura, of strength. He is the Klipa of the ox. He is the leader of the 35 nations on the left side. So therefore, the Torah prohibits us to unite these two. Lot Haros Beshoru Bahamor Yachdav. That union poses a very grave danger for the entire world because they represent all the forces of Tumah. You have all the 70 guardian angels of the nations of the world coming together to fight. Says the Megale Amukot, 
This helps us understand also what transpired between Esav and Yaakov during that fateful moment when Yitzchak Avinu gave Esav, gave Yaakov the blessings. What did Esav do after Yaakov received the blessings? The Pasuk says, Vayelech Esav et Yishmael, el Yishmael. Esav went to Yishmael, Vayikach et Mahalat bat Yishmael, lo leisha. And he took the daughter of Yishmael, her name was Mahalat, and he married her. What's going on here? Says the Megalah Muket, listen to this everyone. We know that Yaakov's Midah is the Midah of Tiferet. Tiferet is amalgamation between the Midot of Chesed from Abraham and the Gevurah of Yitzchak. When Esav realized that Yaakov Avinu had succeeded in taking the Brachot away from him, he concluded that the reason why he was able to do so is because he himself, Esav, only had the power of the klipa of the ox. He only had one on his side, which was the side of the left, where Yaakov, on his side, since he was an amalgamation of both Abraham and Yitzchak, he had both sides. He had the chesed and the geburah. So what did Esav cleverly do? He went to Yishmael's house and he married the daughter of Yishmael, Yishmael, which was, like we said, the corrupt midah of chesed of Abraham. And he took his daughter, took Yishmael's daughter as a wife. So now he would also have the powers of chesed and gevurah on his side, albeit from the side of the klipa, the negative forces. And now, now Esav said, I can overcome my brother Yaakov because he has two sides. I have two sides. Recognizing what Esav did, Yaakov says, you think you're smart. You think you can outsmart me? Yaakov sent him the following message while he was, when he, right before he met him, back many years later. He says, Im Lavan Garti. I lived with Lavan. And Rashi says that the word Garti is an anagram for Tariag 613. He was saying that I lived with Lavan, but at the same time I observed all 613 mitzvot and I was not influenced by his evil ways. And to emphasize the point, what does Yaakov Avinu say? Vahili shor vahamor. That I had the shor vahamor with me because even though those forces were trying to come against me, the shor and the hamor, I had the Torah. I had the Tariag mitzvot with me. Even with the forces of Tumah, the ox and the donkey, I still have the power to defeat you. So you better watch out, Esav. So with that understanding, the Megalea Mukot explains why the form of the Egel, of the golden calf, the upper half resembled an ox, and the lower half resembled a donkey. The Gemara Masechet Shabbat says that when Bnei Israel approached Har Sinai, the contamination of the Nahash, the snake, ceased to affect them. But after the Chet Egel, it returned in full force. Lo kiblu Yisrael la Torah, ela kedei shlo ye malach hamavet sholech bayin, the Gemara in Abu Dazra says. When Bnei Israel accepted the Torah, that's it, there was no Malach HaMav, it was over, it was done. But now that they did the Chet Egel, it's back and full forth, like men you shall die. The Midrash makes a very similar statement. Mikhtav, mikhtav Elohim harut ala luchot, that the script on the Luchot, on the tablets, was provided by God. It was engraved on the Luchot. But the word Harut can be read Herut, freedom. Herut mina galuyot, Herut mi Malach HaMavet. You are going to be free from exile. You're going to be free from the angel of death. And therefore, when they made the Chet Egel, which overturned that freedom, the Egel took the form of the ox and the donkey. It indicated that the, because of the sin of the Chet Egel, the Satan succeeded in uniting the forces once again between the ox and the donkey, the two klipot of Esav and Ishmael. And therefore, the reality of the Satan, who Amalach HaMavet, the angel of death, the Galuyot among the 70 nations, 35 by Ishmael, 35 by Esav, that returned. And that's the words, the words, the holy words of the Megalea Mukot. So what's the connection to Elul? What's the connection to the holy month that we're in in preparation for the high holidays? Well, due to the fact that the Chet Egel represented this 
reunion of the ox and the donkey, Aesav and Ishmael, Moshe Rabbeinu, alav shalom, he shattered that first set of Luchot because it no longer was Cherut, so he had to break them. In contrast, what took place during the month of Elul? During the month of Elul, HaKadosh Baruch Hu accepted Moshe's prayer to give Bnei Israel a second set of Luchot. That's when he went back up. So it behooves us to make amends, to make a, taka, a tikkun during the month of Elul for that unfortunate circumstance of the Cheta Egel, which, you, which reunited the ox and the donkey. What we need to explain now, however, is how the separation of the ox from the donkey is accomplished. How am I supposed to divide the two? And how do I prevent their union? So says Rav Pinchas Friedman, an unreal idea. He says, let's go back to that Gemara Masechet Avodah Zarah that we quoted. We said, Tana Develiyao, Le'olam Yasim Adam Atzmo Adivre Torah Keshor La'ol Vechachamo Lemasoi. That person should always apply himself to the Torah like an ox to a yoke and like a donkey to a burden. We have to figure out and understand what is the difference between an ox to a yoke and a donkey to a burden. And how does that apply to Torah study? And we need to also clarify somewhere else in the Torah where we see a connection between Torah and donkey. For those that may or may not know, this comes in the form of Yaakov's blessing to his son Yisachar. Yisachar was the tribe that represented Torah study. And Yaakov's blessing to Yisachar was Yisachar Chamor Garem Rovetz Ben Amishpetayim. Yisachar is a strong boned donkey. He rests between the boundaries. And Rashi says that just like a strong boned donkey, he bears a heavy burden. Which that burden? That burden, the yoke of Torah. It's puzzling though, seeing as a person must study the Torah like an ox to a yoke and the donkey a burden. Why did Yaakov Avinu only mention the donkey? Why did he leave out the ox? If we need to have both the ox and the donkey. That says the Khatam Sofer, that an ox with a yoke symbolizes in-depth Torah study, which aims to clarify the precise nuances and the details of the halakha. We call that a yun, whereas the donkey bearing the burden symbolizes the reviewing of the details of the halachot. Back to the Ben Ishchai and the Ben Yoyada, again, whose hilula is tonight. Le'olam yasim adam atzmo kesho le'ol v'chachamo le'masoi. A person has to apply the Torah like an ox to a yoke and a donkey to his burden. Nireli bisiata dishmaya, he says. Kesho le'ol belimud ha'iyun v'asevara. What does it mean applying yourself like an ox? The deep study of the of the Torah, the Gemara, the Rashi, the Tosfot, the analytics, everything behind it. Being well versed, have a comprehensive knowledge of everything. Says the Hafez Chaim that the function of the ox is to plow the earth. That's its job. If I was to own an ox, now it's not for its meat. Ox meat is not good. It's to use for my field, to plow the earth, so that it will be able to bear fruit. And therefore, that's what it means, that the the strength of the ox yields an abundance of crops. The function of the donkey, in contrast, is to carry the crops that have been harvested on the field as a result of the ox plowing. So this is all analogous to the Torah study, says the Hafez Chaim. First, a person has to work hard to comprehend the words of the Torah, like the ox and plow. And then, once the mitzvah is understood clearly, then he reviews it over and over again so that he doesn't forget it. This distinction between the ox and the donkey parallels two philosophies and approaches to the Torah study. You have a comprehensive, extensive knowledge versus in-depth knowledge. Now the Gemara talks about this. We see that the two types of Torah are described as Sinai and Oker Harim. Which one is better, the Gemara says. Is Sinai better? Comprehensive knowledge that covers a large spans of area? Or is Oker Harim, uprooting of the mountain, going deep, plowing in, and finding the deeper messages of the Torah? 
So, the Gemara says, you should know that Sinai is Adif. Sinai is better. To have a comprehensive, well-rounded understanding of the Torah. The Gemara says, Rav Yosef Sinai. One of the Amoraim was Rav Yosef. He was a Sinai type of Torah studier. He had a very comprehensive knowledge. Rabba Okerarib. Rabba was was the uprooter of mountains. Shalchu letaman ezemem kodem. So they asked, which one should we hire? Which one is better? Shalchu le Sinai Adif. Sinai is better. Go hire Rav Yosef. De Amar Mar Hakotzrichin lemarechitiye. Because Mar says, everybody needs the owner of wheat to acquire wheat to bake bread. Everyone requires a scholar with a lot of knowledge. Yosef did not accept the job. He didn't accept the job. Malach Rabba Esin Vetartin Shnin. Rabba took the job. He he was the head of the yeshiva for 22 years. And then Behadar Malach Rabbi Yosef. And when Rabba passed away, Rabbi Yosef ruled, uh, ruled over. So now... The explanations of the Hatam Sofer, the Ben Ben Yoyada, the Chafetz Chaim regarding that pasuk Leolam Yasim Adam Atzmoa Divrei Torah Kesho Leor VeChamol Masoi makes perfect sense. The characterization of an ox to a yoke applies to a scholar who studies with pilpul to achieve a very profound understanding of the Torah, the issues at hand. He explores the similarities. He explores the differences between the issues. He compares, he contrasts. You have Rashi, Tosvot, Rambam, Ramban, all the Me'iri, all the different Rishonim and Aharonim till you arrive at the truth of the matter. And that's like the ox. The ox who bears the yoke of the plow to uproot and turn over the earth, to remove the stones, to filter out everything, leaving the earth ready, leaving the earth ready and favorable to plant and to grow. And on the other hand, you have the characterization of the donkey to a burden. And that is a different type of scholar. First, the ox, yes, plows the field so that various fruits can produce and be cultivated and harvested. But then that load of fruit and and crops and grain needs to be loaded on a donkey. And after a person has clarified the halachic issue, like an ox bearing a yoke, he has to review and study and study and go over and over and over. And that task of the donkey does not perform the same labor as the task of the ox. The task of the donkey is just to carry what was already harvested. The ox is the one that is digging deep. So therefore the the Sinai studier has to carry with him all the refined halachot in the Torah like a donkey carrying a load of sefarim on its back ensuring that it's well versed. So this is what the Tanah de Beliau in the Academy of Eliyahu, intentionally mentioned the ox before the donkey. First you need to be assured for the uh, the, uh, the ox for the yoke. You need to dig deep. And then, So now, why didn't Yaakov Avinu bless his son Yisachar with the ox? Why only the donkey? So the answer is simple. Seeing as he carries on his shoulder the fruit of clarified halachot that he studied, it must be that he had already performed the work of the ox. He already plowed the depths of Torah. He already employed the methodology of pilpul, of analyzation. And now he assumes the role of the donkey. And he bears the heavy load of the halachot. So therefore, the description of the donkey with a load incorporates within it the description of an ox with a yoke as well. And that's why Yaakov only mentioned Issachar Chamor Garin. And this helps us understand what the Megalea Amukot said, which we quoted before, that Esav HaRasha went to Yishmael's house to take Mahalat as a wife, so that he could harness these two forces of the Klippa, the ox and the donkey, to help him combat Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov's Midah was Tiferet, was a combination of Chesed and Gevura from the realm of Kedusha. So how did Yaakov manage to confront this? How could Yaakov, now that he, now that he married, now, now that Yishmael gave his daughter to Esav, what was Yaakov to do? It's head versus head. How is he going to defeat Esav? Says the Mishnah, the Mishnah we all know. Ashelosha devarim ha'olam omed. 
על התורה ועל העבודה ועל גמילות חסדים. The world stands on three pillars, Torah, religious service, and acts of kindness. And the Zohar says that three, these three pillars are the three avot. That Abraham Avinu is the chesed, milut chasadim, Yitzchak is the avoda, and Yaakov Avinu, ha-Torah da Yaakov, says the Zohar. Yaakov is the pillar of Torah. Therefore, by studying Torah, by studying Torah like an ox bearing the yoke and like a donkey bearing a load from the realm of Kedusha, that's how Yaakov Avinu was able to subdue the union of Esav and Ishmael, the ox and the donkey of the Klippa. And that's what he told him. Vahili shor vahamor. I, I studied the Torah like a shor and I studied the Torah like a chamor, the way of the shor and the way of a chamor. I plowed like an ox. And I carried on my backs like a chamor. Vahili shor vahamor. You have nothing against me because my Torah can defeat your klipot. So this is what is expected from us during the month of Elul. It is our very holy job now, right now, to rectify the damage that was caused by the Cheta Egel. The top half of the Egel which represented or looked like an ox, the bottom half resembling a donkey, indicating that these combined forces of Esav and Ishmael prevailed over them. And it's our job to abolish these unholy forces now during the month of Elul, the same month that Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Shamaim to receive the second Luchot. And we do that by studying Torah. Shor le'or v'chamor le'masa'or. These two methodologies, rigorous, in-depth analysis and comprehensive knowledge. Sinai and Oker Harim by means of the ox and the donkey of Kedushah, were able to abolish the union of Yishmael and Esav, the ox and donkey of the Klippa. I want to end off with the following idea. What the Ora Chaim HaKadosh brings down in Parashat Tetzaveh, he brings it down in the name of the Zohar. And he, the Zohar asserts that the last Galut is attributable to the sin of Bitul Torah, being remiss with regards to Torah study. And consequently, Bezrat Hashem, the future Geula will come in the merit of diligently studying Torah. I'm going to read what it says. I'm going to be Yoseh ben Chalafta. Yashav ibn Rabbi Yitzchak. Rabbi Yoseh ben Chalafta sat in front of Rabbi Yitzchak. Amar lo, he said to him, Shema shama mar madua nitarechu kol kach yemot hamashiach begalut zo. Dear Master, can you tell me, can you explain to me, maybe you have a reason why we're suffering so much in this Galut? Amal lo Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak told him, Lo itarecha galut ela b'shel bitul Torah. The only reason why this galut is so prolonged is because we are wasting our times, we are not studying Torah, we're doing things that are unnecessary, needless, and we're not studying. Ki kach shamati merav hamnuna saba, for I once heard from Rav Nuna saba, shalosh galuyot galu Yisrael, veni galu mehen bizchut gimel ha'avot. The first three of the Galuyot that the Jewish people were exiled, they were redeemed in the merit of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Aval mea galut ha-reveit, but from the fourth Galut, the one we're in now, Yigalu Yisrael bizchut Moshe, they will be redeemed, we, Ben Yisrael, will be redeemed in the Zechut Moshe. Bo be'erelecha, come and I will show you, shelo galu Yisrael el al bitul Torah. The Jewish people were only exiled because they didn't study Torah. Shneemar, as it says in Yirmiyahu, Vayomen Hashem al ozva metorati. God said, because they, for, they, forsake, they have forsaken my Torah. Amar Hashem, Vagaluyot arishonot chazru bizchut Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. The first three Galuyot, the Jews returned because of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Achshav hem chatu betorah shenatati lemoshe. But now, but now, they sinned with the Torah that I gave Moshe. When they come back, they perform Teshuvah and they engage in the study of Moshe's Torah. In his Zechud, I will redeem them. How do we explain this? Look what the Arizal says. Unbelievable message. There are four Galiot. Babel, Madai, Yavan, and Edom. Those four galuyot constitute the entire body of the klipa, of the negative forces. Bavel, 
represents the head. Madai represents, and Madai in Paras, Persia, represents the two arms. Madai in Paras. And Edom, the last one, Edom and Ishmael, represents the legs, the two lower extremities. That's why the legs are the longest part of the body. We are in the last Galut, the one that corresponds to the two legs, Galut Ishmael, Galut Edom. They correspond to the ox and the donkey who want to join forces to wage war against Israel. And it was exactly for this reason why the Torah commanded us in this week's parasha, Lo tacharos besor ubahamor yachdav, not to plow with an ox and a donkey together. The key for us is to commit to studying Torah keshor laol v'chachamor lemasaoi with rigorous in-depth analysis like the shor by means of the ox and as well a comprehensive knowledge by means of the donkey. With By using the ox and the donkey in its holy form through Kedusha, we will eliminate the ox and the donkey of the Klipot of Esav and Ishmael. That's how we're going to merit the final Geulah Rabotai. It's incumbent upon, upon us now during these days to take upon ourselves some more Torah study. And that's your choice, what you want to do. There are different different Torah studiers. There are those that love the in-depth, the Gemara, the Rashi, the Tosvot, and there are those that like to move a lot quicker. They're both good, and they both help us get to the ultimate goal, where Yaakov Avinu faces Esav one last time and says, Sorry, buddy, I got one more over you. In Lavan Garti, I, I fulfilled all 613 mitzvot. You're not going to defeat me. I have the ox and I have the donkey as well, but not a physical ox and donkey, a spiritual ox and donkey, where I study Torah in both ways. And now I carry with, I carry with me on my shoulders all this tremendous comprehensive knowledge that I'm giving over to my children, Yisachar, Hamor Garim, and that is our job. The more Torah that we study, the more Torah that we learn, now in the month of Elul, especially, will help us bring the Geulah swiftly in our times. Amen. Wishing everyone a wonderful night.